Okay, well, glad to see so many people turning out today. I know you maybe uh, would have rather gone to the beach or done something like that, but uh, I see you, you show up a broad interest by coming, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy this little presentation I have for you about the U-boat the war off the North Carolina coast during the first seven months of 1942. This is an uh, artist's rendition of the Dixie era going down off Hatteras. During the first six months of 1942, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, uh, not really anything in August through July, 30 or so U-boats took part in operations off the North Carolina coast. Uh, during this time, they sank somewhere in the range of 80 ships. They also ended up uh, killing about 1,700 people that weren't able to survive the the sinkings or the fires or the other problems that occurred with, with these sinkings. We were able to sink a few of their boats in this period of time, nothing like the number of, of boats that they sank. We were able to sink the U-85, the 701, the 352, and the uh, 576 uh, off Hatteras. So it was sort of a lopsided deal there. Uh, we did get a little better near the near the end of the battle, uh, specifically in May, June, and July. Now, the Germans, when they came over here, uh, basically came in two types of boats, two different types of, of U-boats. One U-boat was uh, designated as a Type 9 boat. It was about 260 feet long. They could carry as many as 24 torpedoes carry a fair amount of fuel, stay two or three weeks, and virtually get the job done that they were sent over here to do. The other type boat that came a little later was a Type 7 boat. The 7 boat uh, just happens to be the type vessel of the four U-boats that we sank during this period of time. Although in the beginning, the Type 9 boats were the ones that, that did most of the damage. That's a shot of the Byron Benson going down uh, up off Duck. Uh, the Rockefeller, which was really one of the largest tankers in the world at the time, going down off Hatteras. And the Australia going down off Hatteras. Uh, of course, when these boats went down, this is what happened a, a lot of the, of the times. Some of the boats went down with no survivors. A lot of the boats went down they did have survivors, and the survivors ended up on pieces of floats, uh, maybe a lifeboat or two, or anything they could climb on to stay afloat until they were picked up. Now, where did these boats come from? If you look there, you can see the Bay of Biscay uh, down along the French coast. The stage was set for this battle a good time before it happened, when the U-boat started, uh, started coming out of this area. Uh, they came from pins that were built starting at the beginning of, or at the end of uh, 1941. And all these boats could house there uh, in these pins along that coast. They didn't have to come all the way from Germany. That trip to Cape Hatteras from there was about 3,000 miles, and it took them about two weeks to get over here. This guy, Carl Donitz, uh, Admiral Donitz, was the head of the U-boat operations during the entire uh, Second World War. He was in charge of everything that went on. He had a small staff and actually became the Fuhrer after Hitler uh, killed himself. He named Donitz as his successor. Of course, in the end, Donitz, uh, like all the rest of them, ended up in jail. So his tenure as Fuhrer of Germany only lasted a couple of weeks. This guy, Admiral King, was our leader. He was the chief of naval operations at the time. Now, during this period, we really got a slow start. In the beginning, we didn't have many destroyers operating off the coast. The eastern sea frontier was very uh, sparsely uh, protected. The Army Air Force and the Navy really couldn't get together. So in the beginning, the U-boats really had it pretty much wide open out in the Atlantic. Uh, this fellow, as I said, King, was the head of the Navy. He had quite a few destroyers, oh, up in the range of 30 or so. But he was keeping these destroyers uh, inside because he knew he might need them for troop carrier escorts or other purposes. So he wouldn't really release them to the 
to the to the war that was going on off the, the coast of North Carolina and the other East Coast ports. Later on in the conflict down around April and May, he did release more destroyers than he did in the beginning. Now this fellow, uh, Richard Zapp, came over in his U-66 and started the show off here off Cape Hatteras on the 18th of January, 1942. He took the direct route across. A lot of the other boats that participated in op Operation Palkinslog, which was the operation that was going on during these first sinkings, uh, took the northern route. He came straight across and came right into Hatteras somewhere around the 17th, 18th of the month. This is the first boat that went down off Cape Hatteras, the Allen Jackson. It was about 60 miles at sea when he found this ship and, uh, and sank it. There were, I think, eight survivors from this ship, uh, which was pretty uh, spectacular since the boat was as much as 60 miles off the coast when it went down and went down pretty fast. After he sank that boat, he came up uh, in the duck area and sank a ship called the York, uh, sometimes known as the Norvana. A lot of you who are divers have probably been up to the York back in the 80s and 90s. This particular boat uh, was one of the, the major locations for dive operators out of Oregon Inlet. This, this one, the uh, Benson and the U85 were the three boats that the, the dive charters usually went to during that period of time. This particular ship, uh, as I said, Zap sank it, went down so fast that there were no survivors. Uh, no one survived from the sinking of the York. This guy, Reinhard Hardigan, came over in his U-123. As I said, these first boats were Type 9 boats. They were a little larger than the seven boats. They could carry more torpedoes. They could stay longer. The Germans really didn't think, or Donitz really didn't think, that the smaller seven type boats could make it over here and stay long enough to actually create any problems. He found out pretty soon that uh, they could on in February and March and quite a few of the sevens came along with the nines. But he was in a, in a type nine. He showed up, uh, he came down from the north. He, his part in Operation Palkin Slog started up north. He actually sank the first ship uh, that was sunk during that operation sank three or four ships up off New York and headed on down to Hatteras to get in on the action down there. This ship is one of the, the first ones, or, or the, the first one that he sank in this area, the city of Atlanta, and some of you that are divers have uh, passenger ships. Some of, the, of you that are, are divers have been on this particular boat. It's usually fairly murky, not a really great dive, except uh, for the exceptional day when maybe it is. Uh, Corbett's probably been out there on a good day, but Anyhow, a nice dive if you get a good day uh, to go on it. On it. Now, it was, it was, this was one ship, it was only six or seven miles off the coast. Uh, I believe it happened on the 19th of January. But the people in Avon especially could see the fires and uh, they heard the explosions. One fellow down here who was a fisherman told me he thought that uh, the boat must have been loaded with dynamite. It made such a uh, racket when it blew up. Uh, it created a lot of problems. He's told me that uh, chimneys were blown off houses. All types of little situations occurred up on the, on the beach. This, this ship was sunk so close to the shore. After he sank that one, he immediately took off and sank the Silta Vera, which is another ship that uh, the divers like down here and have been on quite a few times. Uh, he did that within a day after he sank the first ship. Now that more or less ended the month of January. Eight ships were sunk off the coast of North Carolina in January. These are the three of them, uh, that were, four of them that were sunk and they were, there were four more. January ended, the people along the coast knew something was really happening uh, and they were probably in for a long war. This guy came along in February. Uh, nine ships went down off the North Carolina coast in February. This fella, Otto Schultz, and he was in a Type 9 boat. You can see his boat over on the right-hand side there. If you have noticed the Type 7 boats, they have saddle tanks that carried the fuel. These boats didn't have saddle tanks. They were pretty 
straight along the edges. I said they were a little longer, they were 260 feet long, had a bigger deck gun and could stay uh, for a longer period of time. Anyway, he, uh, he came over in February along uh, with some more captains. And one of the first ships he sank along the Carolina coast was the, uh, the Baroque. Now, the Baroque was a Brazilian freighter. Uh, Brazil, as most of you probably know, was a neutral country in the beginning, during the beginning of the war. Uh, he came by this boat in the afternoon and the captain on the boat saw him and saw him. He was heading north, the U-boat was heading north. And so the captain thought he had it made. He said, well, they recognize that we're a, a neutral boat and we don't have to worry about getting sunk. Well, he headed on up north and uh, as nighttime fell, uh, Schultz decided he'd sink him anyway. He could see his, his flags and he could see that the boat was neutral. But he went ahead and sank the Baroque, and uh, that was the end of that. Uh, protest was put in, of course, by Brazil, but it wasn't long after that that uh, Schultz went along and sank another boat. Within three days, it was a Brazilian boat. After that, the Brazilians decided to pull out from their neutral uh, uh, position and join the Allies. So I don't know what type of trouble he got in when he got back to Germany, apparently none. After he sank the Baroque, he sank another ship that a lot of you have probably heard of, the Mayor. It was uh, the longest ship sunk off the North Carolina coast during uh, the war. It was 550 feet long, quite a, almost two football fields long, if you can imagine that, a ship being that big back in those days. The ship went down, sank upside down, so it's, uh, uh, it's a difficult dive if you're out there trying to find the pilot house or find anything to look at. Generally, all you see is the, the hull. Uh, if you're lucky, you might end up in an area that you see a little bit more than that. It's generally a, a fairly murky dive, not a great dive, but it, it, uh, it was a ship that went down in February, and it was the longest ship that went down off the Carolina coast and during, the, during the war. Now, this fellow was quite a, a, a captain, Johann Moore. Uh, he uh, was one of Hitler's favorites, sent him over here, and he sank six ships in six days. He, he was quite an operator. He moved around pretty rapidly, and he, he, he used all his torpedoes up within a week and headed back to, uh, to Germany. So I said he sank, oh, excuse me, France. He sank more ships in, a, in a, a, such a rapid time as anyone that was operating off the coast here. Two of the ships he sank, the Papoose and the NACO, and six uh, and four other ships off the coast, as I said, in, in a very short period of one week. He finished up, the radio Donitz told him what he had done, said picking was good over here, and headed back to, headed back to France. This thing's moving a little fast for me here today. Let's see, here's another ship that went down uh, in March. This fella in his Type 9 U-boat, uh, Erwin Roston sank a ship called the Carib Sea. Now the Carib Sea was a small freighter. This little boat was proceeding along from the south to the north and there was a fellow on board that actually was from Ocracoke, uh, Jim Gaskell. Now as he was proceeding along, he was told that by the captain that they would be off Ocracoke in a very short period of time and if he wanted to, to stay up on the bridge or to maybe see the, the lighthouse over on Ocracoke, that would be all right. But he decided not to do it. He went, went down and, and went to bed. Very shortly after that, Roston torpedoed the, the Carib Sea as the boat was just, just off Ocracoke, uh, some number of miles, and sank it. There were a few survivors, but Jim Gaskell wasn't, wasn't one of them. Now his father lived in the, or owned the Pamlico Inn over on Ocracoke, and that was where he lived before he, he ended up on, in the war. Uh, pretty amazing story, about three days after the ship went down, an oar and a, a little case washed up inside Ocracoke, came through the inlet and washed up not very far from the Pamlico Inn. The oar had Carib Sea written on it, and the little glass case that, that came in 
actually had Jim Gaskell's uh, license inside it. Uh, how in the world this was able to navigate through the inlet and up behind the Pamlico Inn, of course, is not really known. But even today, I guess it's still there, the oars in it uh, made, is made into a cross and it's in the church over there on Ocracoke. But that was a pretty amazing story. This guy, Walter Fleshmer, Fleshburg, excuse me, uh, sank the Dixie Air. We've seen a couple of shots of the Dixie Air already. And there it is going down. This was, of course, in March. Now, in March, which was the, the largest number of ships went down during this month, uh, of any months during our uh, activities during the war, 26 ships went down off the North Carolina coast in March, which was quite a few ships. We still hadn't had any luck sinking one. April came along and we did a little bit better. Uh, as you can see from this chart, uh, the U-85 is up off Nags Head. It was the first U-boat that we sank during World War II. The, the military had finally gotten their act together. The Navy and the Air Corps were working together. There were a few more destroyers in the area. Other boats were out there patrolling. And U-85 just happened to be the, the, the unlucky U-boat to be the first one to go down. After that one, the 352 down off Moorhead City, the next month was sunk. Uh, then the 701 up off Hatteras, and then the U-576 uh, close to Hatteras. So they, that, they're the ones that we sank during World War II. Uh, not really too many compared to the number of ships that they sank. There's a shot of the U-85 coming into St. Nazaire in February of 1942, just before going out on their, their final mission. You can see Gregor up in the conning tower. That's a Type 7 boat. You can see those saddle tanks on the side. Shot of Captain Gregor talking with one of the men up on the, uh, up on the docks. Now this Go back one there. This is the ship that sank them, the uh, Roper, DD-147. It just happened that on the night of April the 14th, they were out patrolling uh, in the area. They weren't really looking for anything in particular, just out riding around to see if they could maybe spot a U-boat. And it just so happened that the 85 was also in the vicinity. They, of course, the, the story was on the surface, and the, uh, the, the U-boat was on the surface. The U-boat knew they were coming, but uh, apparently Gregor, the captain of the U-boat, didn't seem to uh, worry too much about it. And they proceeded along for a pretty good ways before the destroyer pulled up close enough to the U-boat to realize that it was a U-boat. The U-boat fired one torpedo at the destroyer, missed them, went by their starboard side. That's when the, the men on the destroyer came to battle stations. Uh, they more or less tried to catch the U-boat. The U-boat turned to the right, tried to make a circle, come around and fire their the forward torpedo tubes. They'd already fired their stern tube, of course. Uh, they couldn't make it all the way around. The destroyer came around to their side and fired a three-inch shell into the area right behind the conning tower, uh, penetrated the pressure hull of the U-boat, and the U-boat went down. Now, whether or not the U-boat was scuttled, uh, if the captain ordered it scuttled, or if that one shell hole was enough to cause the U-boat to sink, still really isn't known. When I first started diving on that wreck, the hole that uh, the penetration was only maybe something like that, a very small hole. Now that the hole is large enough you, that you can swim into the boat through that particular opening. But anyway, the uh, the boat went down, the men jumped overboard, thought they were going to be rescued by the destroyer. Destroyer ran through them one time. A fellow that was on the destroyer, who was supposed to try to cut the, the raft loose for them to get on, uh, said he couldn't get it loose the first trip around. So they told him to go around again. The uh, destroyer went around one more time. The, uh, they thought uh, on the destroyer they had picked up another U-boat. When they went through the or over the men, uh, through the men, and where the, the, the boat went down, they pitched out 11 depth charges into the sea, which of course killed all the, all the men that worked, uh, that had jumped off the U-boat and thought they were probably gonna be rescued. 
They were picked up the next morning and carried up to, up to Norfolk, up to Naval Air, Naval uh, Base. This is a shot of one of the men on the, I guess he's still on the uh, roper there, and he's being transferred to a tug called the Skiota, which took him on into shore. Uh, all the men of, on the 85, of course, were killed. There were no survivors. No one on the destroyer was hurt. And that was the first boat to go down during World War II uh, off the North Carolina coast. Now it's April and this fellow shows up over here, uh, Eric Topp. Some of you may have heard of Eric Topp before. His boat was a U-552, uh, famous for sinking the Reuben James way back uh, six or seven months before, before the, the war ever started up off Iceland. The Reuben James was escorting a, a convoy. He came up at night, said he didn't realize it was an American boat, and uh, he fired and hit the Reuben, game, Reuben James and killed most of the men on, on that particular boat. But he almost did as, as well as uh, Johann Moore did. He came over, uh, reached the North Carolina coast, and he sank six ships in eight days, used all his torpedoes, and headed back to uh, back to, to France. Now you can see a, a, a ship that can, or a boat that can come over and do that, ride around and more or less sink ships at uh, their discretion, shows that we really didn't have a whole lot going as far as our uh, protective forces at that time, although things were getting better in April. That's a, a ship that most of you have heard of or, or maybe dove on the uh, Benson up off Duck and uh, Corolla. Uh, northern, on the northern banks. He torpedoed this ship and it, it drifted for quite a few days before it ever sank. It made a tremendous fire, a, a tanker. And that was about it for April. Like I said, April was a uh, uh, pretty active month. Uh, I think 19 ships went down off the North Carolina coast in, in April. Now in the next month, this fella came along in May uh, and his boat ended up down on the bottom, down off Moorhead City, uh, Helmut Ratke. He wasn't really the greatest U-boat captain there ever was. He was in a Type 7 boat. He ended up just off Hatteras, uh, maybe a little southwest of Hatteras, coming in about 200 miles off the coast on the night of the 5th. There's a picture of Ratke with uh, his crew at the commission of the boat. Anyhow, he was coming in off the, off the coast and he ran up on this little freighter called the Frieden. The Frieden was a, a very small boat, uh, but it, and it was night, the moon was out, and he could see it. He was out about 250 miles from the coast, but he decided to sink it anyhow. Now, if you remember, this particular type U-boat had four forward torpedo tubes and one stern tube, and they only carried 14 torpedoes when, when he left when he left France, he only had 14 torpedoes to use, and he'd have to go home after he, he fired all those. Anyway, he's coming in, and he sees this little freighter, the Frieden, up uh, off behind him. So he decides to sink him. So he pulls up in position. I remember it's night time, and the Frieden's coming along at seven or eight knots. And they pull up uh, pretty close to the U-boat. He fires a torpedo. Well, the men on the, the Frieden, the lookouts, can see it coming, and they scream out a warning that a torpedo's on the way, but it's too late to, for the helmsman on the, the Frieden to do anything. The torpedo, uh, fortunately for the Frieden, passed off the bow, maybe a couple of hundred feet, so he missed. Well, they kept on uh, moving along. The Frieden uh, didn't change course. Rack, he ordered his boat to move up ahead of the Frieden again and take another shot. So he did. He moved up and uh, got in position again. About 30 minutes later, he fired another torpedo. Well, the lookouts on the Frieden saw it coming again, and they screamed out a warning, but it was too late again. Well, this time the torpedo passed under the Frieden. It was set too deep. They saw it come out on the other side. The men on the, on the Frieden after this uh, seen two torpedoes in 30 minutes had had about enough. So. Uh, the captain said, well, we'll abandon ship. So they did. They got in the lifeboats. It was a calm night. Got, got in the lifeboats, climbed down, and uh, 
sat around a little while, and the captain started thinking about it a little bit, and he said, well, this might not be too good an idea after all. We're out here 300 miles off the coast in a little lifeboat, got a perfectly good uh, ship right here. We might as well get it back on, see what we can do. So they all climbed back on the boat, started up again, took off again. Well, Ratke had moved up ahead uh, of them. He missed them. He didn't see them when they had stopped, and he was going to try another shot. Well, he's fired two of his four torpedoes already. So he moves up, and here they come again. Well, he, he moves in very close this time to the freighter, 300 yards or so, which is very close, and he fires the third torpedo. Well, this one, they see it coming again, and uh, this one goes under the boat again. So uh, anyway, they keep on going, and Ratke's pretty upset, but he says, let's pull ahead, we'll go around their, their bow, and uh, we'll pull over on the, on the port side and, and see what we can do from the port side. So he did. He pulled up, uh, and when the Freedom came by 30 or 40 minutes later, he fired his fourth torpedo. Now, he's fired a third of the torpedoes he brought over here with him at this one little boat. Anyway, here it comes. They see it coming. And this time the torpedo is set so shallow, it skips out of the water and sails along ahead of the boat. Well, <laughs> this time they had had enough. The men on the, on the uh, freedom said, the guy's got to be the biggest idiot in the, <laughs> in the German Navy, but he's going to get us sooner or later. So uh, again, they abandoned ship, got in the lifeboats, and took off. Well, they drifted all night. In the meantime, Ratke was so disgusted, he just turned around and left. He could have <laughs> sunk the thing with his, his 88 gun if he had wanted to, and he had one more torpedo in the stern tube, but he, he was just disgusted. So his report went, and, and he left. Uh, anyway, uh, the men on the Frieden drifted in the lifeboat all night, and when the sun came up the next morning, they noticed that their little boat was, this freighter was drifting right along beside them. So, <laughs> so they, uh, they decided, well, we'll climb back on and try it again. So they did, ended up in New York, and the, the people that interrogated them said it was the most fantastic story they'd ever heard. But that's, <laughs> that just, that shows you what can happen or, or did happen more than once uh, during the war, I'm sure. Well, he, he still wasn't uh, going to have any more luck, Rack. He came in with his 352, operating right off Moorhead City. And he thought he saw another ship to sink, but what he saw was just the Icarus, uh, a Coast Guard cutter. So he decided he'd sink the Icarus, and he fired, uh, uh, he was below surface, it was during the daytime. He fired a torpedo, and he heard an explosion. He thought the boat, uh, the torpedo had hit the ship, the one that he was aiming at, but actually it had hit a sandbar and blown up. So when he surfaced, he was surprised to find that the Icarus was up there waiting for him. And uh, a little boat like this, half the size of the U-boat, uh, uh, with half the armaments, or less than half the armaments, ended up sinking the 352. And uh, about half the men, or maybe a few more than half the men, got off. Well. They didn't have any orders on the, they called in what they had done from the Icarus, but they didn't have really have any orders as to what to do with, about survivors. So they just took off and uh, were heading down to Charleston. And about 30 or 40 minutes later, they did get orders to pick up survivors, and they did pick up quite a few survivors. Survivors, uh, in their testaments, more or less said they thought they were just going to leave them out there, and they, I guess they were or would have if they hadn't gotten orders to pick them up. But they did pick them up and uh, brought them in to Charleston. There's Ratke, a second from the left. They said he was a real Nazi. He thought Hitler was a, the greatest and the smartest man in the world. He wasn't just smart in war, he was smart in everything. And he followed his doctrines right down to the letter. Most U-boat captains were not rigid Nazis. They were, uh, they were seamen who, I guess, were doing their job, but, or trying to. But uh, Iraq, he was a little different. Although he did survive and uh, made it to prison camp. A shot of him being photographed uh, before he, they took him on, on down to prison camp. Now, the last boat, or next to the last boat, uh, that actually did much damage over here, the U-701 uh, was sent over here. They were actually sent, or 
they thought they were going to be sent to act as a uh, boat that would carry saboteurs and land them along the coast someplace here. But the, the operations were moving so fast, his boat, uh, Ratke's, uh, excuse me, uh, Dagan's boat was in, in uh, being worked on and Hitler ordered another boat to take the saboteurs over, which ended up up off New York. Most of those guys all were killed. But anyhow, he shows up over here in May and his order is to go into the harbor up in Newport News or Hampton Roads and plant mines in the channel uh, and then come on down to Hatteras and operate down there and see what he could shoot. So he did, he came across and ended up right up off uh, Norfolk Naval Base one night and he, uh, he was ordered to lay on the bottom and wait a day or so and watch shipping coming in and out. But he made up his own mind that it wasn't really a good idea that if he happened to uh, be located and they sunk him in that shallow water 30 or 40 feet, then probably they would get all the important information and data he had on board. So he decided to go right on in that night when he got there and do what he needed to do. That's uh, Dagon, uh, third from the left, with some of his men on the, on the 701. Now this is more or less what he did, and this was a plan that, that he drew himself, and this was recovered from the 701, uh, from Dagon. He was to come in, in, in the channel between uh, Cape Charles and Cape Henry, and lay mines, and you can see the little circles he had for mines, uh, in the channel. He was right off from Norfolk Naval Station, uh, not very far, he said he could see the cars riding up and down the beach and hear the people over on the beach, uh, see the lights, but nobody seemed to pay any attention to him. And he moved in on the surface, he was running on his electric engines, he followed a tugboat that was actually operating in the channel to see where the channel was, and he moved along and laid his mines, uh, got them all out and was back out at sea by one or two o'clock that night and loading his torpedoes in the tubes where the mines were and getting ready to proceed on down to Hatteras. These mines did sink a couple of ships. Uh, they were set to go off or to arm themselves three days later. So he had plenty of time to get away. The mines armed themselves and ships going in and out of the channel uh, activated them and, and, and they, it, I know they actually sank one and, and damaged two, I think. But the Americans uh, thought there was a U-boat inside, the, uh, inside the, the area there and they sent the patrols out. Of course, they didn't find anything. Now, Dagan got back down off Hatteras and didn't have any luck for a few days until he found this ship, the William Rockefeller. That was one of the largest oil tankers in the world. And he sank it, uh, which was quite an accomplishment, uh, they thought, back in France. And he received uh, uh, certain acclaims for, for doing that. But that was the largest ship that he sank when he was over here. Uh, he also, of course, got himself sunk. This is Harry Kane flying his A-29 bomber out of Cherry Point, North Carolina. He's just out on patrol one day in July, in early July, and he comes across the, 80, the uh, 701 on the surface. They've been up recharging their batteries, and Dagan, when he went out, back down through the, the hat, the conning tower hatch, he later on said, I, I saw the plane, and he said, I knew it was too late, that we were too late, that uh, he was going to get us. And he did. He came in low, dropped uh, depth bombs uh, in the vicinity of the U-boat, and, and of course, sank it. They were in water that was a little over 100 feet deep. Uh, not too many people, I guess, even today, Mark, have been out and, and dove on the 701. Until maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it wasn't located. Once it was located, the dive charters tried to get out there and tried to do, do diving out there, but it's right, very close to the Gulf Stream. You really never know what you're going to find when you get out there. There's a lot of current. Uh, to go 40 miles in a boat and, and not be able to dive, and the captain tell you, no, we can't go, we've got to go do something else, uh, it was pretty upsetting to the divers. So as far as I know, most of the charters don't go uh, as, a, as a rule out to the 701 anymore. It's the only U-boat in North Carolina other than the 576 that really hadn't been disturbed. Uh, a few people have dove on it, but, uh, and a few things have been taken from it, but it's basically undisturbed and uh, 
still has everything on it it had when it, when it, when it died. And this guy, like I said, Harry Kane, he buzzed over, dropped the bomb, uh, three bombs on the 701. He flew around again. He saw the men in the water, uh, quite a few in the beginning. He dropped them a raft. The raft drifted away. They weren't able to, to grab the raft. And uh, so they just were set adrift, out, uh, drifting north in the Gulf Stream. And that's Kane pointing out on a, a chart where he thought he had, had sunk the 701. They were eventually found, the few that were left, there were only five left when they, when they finally found them. That's a blimp from Elizabeth City that uh, was out, I, I think a PBY actually spotted them first, and he's dropping smoke flares. You can see a little raft that a couple of the men are in. No, it's more or less the same shot as a, a PBY on the, on the water there with a couple of blimps flying overhead. They picked these guys up, took them over to Elizabeth City, uh, then they took them back up to Norfolk. Well, that's one of the, the men from the 701 being transported to shore by men from the, uh, from the aircraft. And there's Dagan in the center with the tower wrapped around him uh, and a couple of the other guys that survived. They were in the ocean for about three days and they drifted all the way up off Norfolk, Virginia from Hatteras. A uh, long, long way to go. They all thought they were done for, and they probably would have been if they hadn't picked them up uh, when they did. Dagon was, as they say, pretty delirious at the time, but uh, they got him, and uh, he did survive it. And he and Kane did, and in, in, at a future time, meet and uh, talk about uh, Kane sinking Dagon. Dagon told him it was a good shot, and uh, they apparently had a good time together. And there's another shot of, uh, of Dagon and Cain. Now, Cain didn't really know where he was going. They told him they wanted him to, to fly up to Norfolk for something, and they put him on uh, a plane, flew him up to Norfolk, didn't tell him that Dagon was up there, and they took him in a room, and there was the Dagon, uh, the, the cat, captain of the U-boat that he had just sunk a few days earlier. So they apparently got to be good friends, as good of friends as you could be under, certain, under that type of circuit circumstance. One more U-boat, the uh, 576, uh, was operating off the coast. Now, the end of May and uh, end of June and end of July, Donitz over in France realized that his boats just weren't able to do the job anymore. There were too many planes flying around, too many cutters out patrolling too many destroyers around. So he had more or less made up his mind uh, by the, the 1st of July that operations off the, the coast of North Carolina and other uh, areas along the eastern seaboard, uh, those operations were over. And at the end of uh, the month, or the middle of the month uh, in, in July, he did call the boats away. There were only two U-boats operating off the coast of North Carolina around the middle of July. This fellow, uh, Otto Hines, was in the 576, and another captain, Von Forster, was in his U-boat, and he was operating down around Cape Lookout. Well, about the time these guys were trying to operate off Hatteras and Cape Lookout, a convoy was being formed up in Norfolk, Virginia. Now, we really hadn't been doing much convoy. And in the beginning, the British more or less recommended that we convoy, but uh, uh, King, the Admiral King, who was head of naval operations, didn't want convoy for one reason or another. And they, they went along a long way before they actually decided they would start convoying ships. And this, this convoy formed up off Norfolk, Virginia, about 20 ships, seven or eight uh, patrol vessels, aircraft out of uh, the Naval Air Station up there were to protect them all the way to Key West, uh, Anyhow, they take off. This guy, Heineke, uh, in his boat, the 576, had already been damaged by an aircraft. He had orders to return to France. The other boat had orders to move offshore maybe 300 miles and try to repair his boat and then come back. The little convoy took off and they rounded Cape Hatteras, uh, like I say, about 25, 26 ships with air cover. And even though 576 had orders to return to, to 
France, he couldn't resist the temptation of firing on this convoy. So he came up near the surface, and apparently he was spotted by aircraft before he ever fired, but he fired four of his torpedoes and hit three ships. Uh, he sank one and dam seriously damaged two more. He just, he, he couldn't resist the, the opportunity to attack that convoy. Well, as soon as he fired his torpedoes, which he fired in pretty rapid succession, the U-boat was so light, those things weighed about 3,000 pounds apiece. Uh, it floated up to the surface, or right at the surface, and one of the aircraft saw him, and he flew right over, dropped a couple of bombs on him, and hit him. Uh, he more or less stood up nose first in the water, and the, one of the other ships in the convoy was close enough, and they had an armed guard. They fired their guns at the, at the U-boat and hit him too with, with what they had. And then the boat went down, and that was, that was the end of that. Now, of course, uh, most of you know how deep that boat's down over 600 feet, 650 feet or something. So probably divers won't uh, be disturbing that one. Noah did go to the German embassy and ask them, National Ocean Atmospheric Administration representatives went to see the folks at NOAA, uh, see the folks at the embassy, and ask if they wanted NOAA to try to recover any of the bodies or, or do anything else when they found this boat several years ago. And uh, the German, Germans said no. They did not just let it, let it remain where it was and, uh, and leave it alone. So that's what they did. And with that, that virtually ended the, uh, the U-boat war off North Carolina. The, the ships that were sunk close to 80, I think all but four of them were sunk during this period uh, over the next three or so years. Donitz never returned the U-boats to the East Coast, and he used them in other areas. And, uh, and that was really it. So things sort of got back to normal here in, in July, and uh, by the end of the summer, they were pretty, pretty close to normal. Well, that's, uh, that's a little, little story of the, the uh, U-boat war off the North Carolina coast, and uh, I enjoyed telling it, and I hope you enjoyed hearing it. But uh, thank you so much. <laughs>